This is Unsung History, the podcast where we tell the stories of people and events in American history that haven't gotten much notice. I'm your host, Kelly Therese Pollack. I'll start each episode with a brief introduction to the topic and then interview someone who knows a lot more than I do. Today's episode is about homosexuality and the Communist Party in the United States prior to 1960. There's a popular conception in America that the gay rights movement started with the Stonewall Riots in response to a police raid at the Stonewall Inn in the Greenwich Village neighborhood of New York City in the early morning hours of June 28, 1969. Although the Stonewall Riots were certainly an important and transformative moment in the movement, there were earlier moments of resistance, including a 1959 riot in response to police harassment at the Cooper Donuts Cafe in Los Angeles, a popular hangout for gay people, and a 1966 riot at Compton's Cafeteria in the Tenderloin District of San Francisco in response to violent police harassment of drag queens and trans people. Consensual sexual relations between same-sex couples were illegal everywhere in the United States until 1962, when Illinois became the first state to legalize them, and they remained illegal in 14 states, all the way until the 2003 Lawrence v. Texas Supreme Court decision, in which the court ruled that sanctions or criminal punishment for those who commit sodomy are unconstitutional. So prior to the 1960s, and even into the 2000s, queer people had good reason to keep their sexuality hidden. But even before the activism of the 1950s and 60s, there were of course queer people in the United States. A note here on terminology, the term gay to mean homosexual wasn't in popular usage until the 1960s, and LGBT wasn't used until the late 1980s. In the early 20th century, the terms homosexual or sexual dissident were in more common usage, or queer as an umbrella term. Prior to the 1960s, queer people would not have been welcomed in many political organizations, but one surprising place they were able to find a home for political activism was in the Communist Party. The Communist Party of the United States was established in 1919 after a split with the Socialist Party of America following the Russian Revolution. In the wake of World War I, with increasing labor strikes and a series of anarchist bombings, the first Red Scare took hold in America, and Attorney General Alexander Mitchell Palmer ordered a series of violent law enforcement raids targeting leftist radicals and anarchists. Given the danger of openness at the time, the Communist Party in America initially operated underground. Despite this, from the 1920s to the 1940s, the Communist Party was influential in American politics. At the forefront of labor organizing and the creation of labor unions, as well as opposition to racism, it was the first political party in the United States to be racially integrated. During the Great Depression, Communist ideology became especially appealing to people disillusioned with capitalism, and membership in the party grew to 55,000 by the end of the 1930s. Although the Communist Party has long been thought to have been inhospitable to homosexuals in the early to mid-20th century, some queer folks embraced the radical politics of the party and found it to be a place where they could agitate for radical sexual politics as well. One of the first national gay rights organizations in the United States, the Mattachine Society, was founded in 1950 by prominent communist Harry Hay and a group of male friends in Los Angeles, many of whom were also communists. At his request, Hay was expelled from the Communist Party the following year so that he would not pose a security risk to the party, which formally forbade party membership to homosexuals at the time but the party did declare Hay a lifelong friend of the people. It was around this same time that U.S. Senator Joseph McCarthy was stoking fears of communism in the Second Red Scare, when he claimed that a large number of communists had infiltrated the U.S. State Department. In parallel, in what became known as the Lavender Scare, 
the Senate began an investigation into the government's employment of homosexuals. McCarthy, along with Roy Cohn, and with the help of FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover, were responsible for the firing of hundreds of gay men and women from government employment. McCarthy and others publicly linked homosexuality and communism as threats to the American way of life. In response, the homophile movement that appeared in the 1950s distanced itself from leftist groups and politics. Homosexuals who wanted to be accepted by society needed to prove themselves model American citizens, not leftist sympathizers. And the previous links between homosexuals and the Communist Party were lost or suppressed. In 1953, Harry Hay was ousted from the Mattachine Society that he founded, in part because of his communist affiliation, which by then was considered a liability by the more conservative members of the society. In his book, Love's Next Meeting, The Forgotten History of Homosexuality and the Left in American Culture, Aaron Lechleiter, Associate Professor of American Studies at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, has recovered a rich history of queer communists in the United States in the decades before the Lavender Scare, who saw their sexual dissidents and their leftist sympathies in alignment with each other. To help us learn more, I'm joined now by Aaron to discuss his research and findings in Love's Next Meeting. Hi, Aaron. Thanks for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. So uh, when I started this podcast, I knew there were things in American history I didn't know, but I thought I maybe knew what I didn't know. And this is one of those cases uh, where had you not written this book, I would have had no idea that this was a whole area of American history that I just didn't know at all. So uh, so thanks for that. <laughs> well, thanks for that. I want to start there, I think. So how uh, how did you know that this was an area that uh, that needed to be recovered? Like, how, how did you get into this topic and, and realize that there was a, a whole area here to research? Yeah, it's really, there's multiple points of entry, um, but I'll just preface by saying there were plenty of points in researching this book when I didn't know if it was possible. Um, and the primary reason for that was that there were so many pressures that made maintaining any kinds of records of this history incredibly dangerous. So the place where I entered into it was actually through literature. When I was reading radical fiction from the Depression era, I was just struck by how frequently queer characters, queer themes came up in novels and short stories and whatnot. And it just made me wonder, why was this happening? Was this e e exclusive to literature or was it happening on the ground through lived experiences? And so I just started pulling at any thread I could find. Um, and what I discovered was that while a lot of what I think we would like to be able to learn about homosexuality in the left before 1960 was very effectively suppressed uh, out of a legitimate fear by the people who were thinking about this kind of thing, um, there were still enough records there to weave some kind of narrative about what, uh, what this political convergence looked like. So I sort of came into it unsure what I would be able to find and was pleasantly surprised um, and also impressed by the bravery of folks who did, in fact, uh, allow us to be able to access this history uh, in spite of tremendous pressure not to. So then let's talk some about that process of, of finding these sources of recovering this, because you have this sort of a, a, a massive number of sources in this book. So you're looking at archives, you're looking at literature, you're, you know, reading, I believe, the entire history of the run of new masses. So, you know, how, how did you <laughs> figure out sort of what, where to look, where to go, uh, and you know, in the in the entire sort of <laughs> history of literature of America in the 20th century, which pieces to be looking at, you know, what, what does that process look like? Well, one thing that I'll say is what you see in the book is uh, also where I actually sort of struck gold, as it were, and there were plenty of places where I didn't. So not to digress too much, but at one point I was extremely excited to find out that V.F. Calverton, who edited Modern Quarterly, had written an unpublished essay called Welcome to Fairyland. 
in the 1930s. And so I rushed down to New York and went to the New York Public Library and grabbed at this folder and discovered it was actually a defense of fairy tales. So there were plenty of instances when I was searching for something that didn't pan out. But then on the other hand, I was very interested in this poet, John Malcolm Brennan. Uh, and so my partner happened to be at a conference in Philadelphia that I went with him to. And I said, I'm just gonna drive up to Newark, Delaware and look at these papers just in case there's something. And it turned into a complete treasure trove that unlocked this whole network of leftists that then I was at Princeton looking at uh, John Malcolm Brennan's uh, boyfriend, uh, Keeman Fryer's papers there. And, you know, so there were these kinds of threads that I just, uh, uh, just would find and then just try and pursue. And a lot of these were buried histories so actually finding the records, especially of the lived experience, things like the print run of New Masses, I knew that leftists were not all, but many were reading New Masses at the time. And I thought, well, I have to do that too, because that was what they were reading back, back then. So that part was kind of um, uh, less fraught. Um, but finding the actual individuals, I had no idea. The uh, Ruth Erickson and Eleanor Stevenson, who are two, uh, queer women who were uh, living in Connecticut, for some reason, their papers were out in Oregon. And I just thought, well, I just want to look and see what they had to say when I was looking at another archive out there. And again, they kept all of these letters. And so I was just surprised by that. Um, who knows how many more of these are out there that I didn't find because a lot of this was either not preserved or was just not uh, foregrounded in you know, the the scholarship that was pointing me in their direction. So it, it really was a bit of a, I don't know, it was like foraging for mushrooms or something. And just just uh, when I found them, it was just pure joy um, to, to find that there was something there. And again, you know, we're not supposed to remember this history. Uh, and so you have to kind of stitch together what you can. Um, from the sources that survived. For someone uh, like me, who you know has has some knowledge of uh, 20th century American history, uh, but not a, a deep knowledge of either the left or uh, LGBTQ populations, I guess the thing that really struck me, because I think so much now in politics about identity and identities and uh, you know group cohesion for uh, what you refer to in the book as sexual dissidents, because that's what they refer to themselves then, but you know, the, the queer community largely, was there a, a sense of community? Was this an identity that, that people would have felt they had? Was it a piece of themselves that they were suppressing? Like what, what would that have looked like, uh, you know, in a way to sort of understand why they would be attracted to the left and to the communist party? Yeah, that's a really fa fabulous question. And I think that to answer it, we have to kind of think about what we already uh, sort of know about queer lives before 1960. And a lot of that is the kind of weird push-pull between openness and uh, hiding. And I think that, that na navigating the public and the private dimensions of uh, sexual dissidence was something that was constantly an ebb and flow uh, for much of the 20th century. And the prioritization of a sort of public performance of sexual identity was something that was politicized a little bit later uh, towards, towards the end of the 20th century. But the lived experiences predated that kind of politicization that happened, you know, oftentimes people use Stonewall as a shorthand um, for that. Uh, that was that was something that was um, not happening in an organized way until you get to the 1950s. So I was sort of fascinated by a couple of questions. One was I had this sort of narrative ingrained in me that said, well, the left was very inhospitable to queer people. And that seemed strange to me because the left was so committed to all forms of revolution and um, in fits and starts, not perfectly, but was certainly prioritizing anti-racism and um, trying to foreground the voices and experiences of women uh, and of course, working class people. And I just thought it was a little strange that there was no space for sexual dissidence in that. 
And so I think that what I found was while the left was not necessarily naming queer people, there was an energy in pushing for some kind of liberation against a repressive state that nonetheless spoke to queer people even when they weren't named. And they were named uh, sometimes. There were certainly occasions where they were named. But I think that, you know, absent this kind of push for a politics of visibility that really takes hold, you know, in the 60s and after, or maybe the 50s, but, uh, you know, absent this demand for visibility as the central crux of what queer politics should look like, the revolutionary potential of opposing a state that oppressed people, that became the point of entry far more than a kind of identitarian politics that said, I need a movement that names me. Mm -hmm. It was a movement that named the person who is against me and, you know, or the state. Uh, so that was sort of um, what struck me uh, at the time. Yeah, and I think what's so fascinating is there's a lot of talk now about intersectionality and different groups sort of coming together and understanding common struggles and and that's clearly happening in the the 20s the 30s the 40s and the left uh in ways that uh i think have largely been uh forgotten or you know intentionally suppressed not just the the sexual distance but but you what you were just talking about anti-racism and you know that these are things that are not sort of commonly explored when we think about uh, communism is that uh, because of the the lingering effects of McCarthyism that you know we sort of look back and just think oh communist bad you know that that no matter what else we've sort of come from since McCarthyism that that there is something there that sort of uh, represses this uh, this very rich history. Yeah, and I think that McCarthyism, as you, as you mentioned here, is a real was a really powerful force. So the forgotten in the subtitle to my book, The Forgotten History, uh, that for me was not a calling out of scholars, um, though certainly I think that there's always room for improvement <laughs> in the work that we do. Um, but it was really a indexing of the ways that McCarthyism made remembering criminal, basically, uh, uh, turned remembering this past into a crime and, and the way that responses to that um, created this climate for disavowing the history that was there. You know, in 1932, John Pittman wrote an editorial in a black radical newspaper in San Francisco with the title Prejudice Against Homosexuals and really connected his work as a black radical to um, pushing against the kind of antipathy towards homosexuals that he was observing uh, in San Francisco and made those kinds of connections between anti-racism and opposing this other form of discrimination. We don't start gay history there, right? When we think about gay politics, I guess I should say, or, or sort of gay liberation and, and, and organizing around sexuality, we don't tend to start there. And I think that the reason for that is in large measure because it was part of a broader movement that wasn't um, that wasn't centralizing gay people necessarily, but you know the kind of intersectionality that you're talking about here uh, has now become something that is foundational to a lot of the radical movements we see today. You know, so Black Lives Matter has been an unbelievable force uh, for challenging so many dimensions of American society, and it doesn't have to name Black Queer Lives Matter, even though the movement has been largely organized by black queer people. Um, and, that, and that doesn't diminish the impact, you know, the liberation that, that these capacious social movements are fighting for oftentimes can work in multiple nodes. And there's something really powerful in that, but there's something really dangerous in that. And so when you do have these moments of repression, I think that the targets tend to be really, um, victimized, uh, you know, I hate to use the word victimized because it's so disempowering, but, you know, victimized by the suppression of their own stories, you know, the, the danger in narrating their own experiences. And that was something that I, I think was really common to people on the left and to queer people. So, you know, it's sort of a double whammy uh, in the case of this history. 
So obviously you're recovering a history. So there's a lot that you're finding that maybe was unexpected. Were there particular things that sort of jumped out at you as the sort of most unexpected things that you either didn't think you'd be able to find at all or stories that were just sort of so overwhelmingly interesting that had been completely hidden previously? I think I was more surprised by the documents around lived experience. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, when I was going through new masses, I was less surprised that there was so much material around sexuality because I already knew that they had had to push against obscenity regulations because radical content was always sort of suppressed anyway. So they were just deft at getting around Postmaster and whatnot. Um, so that was a little bit less surprising to me, but I was more surprised by the individuals who held on to those letters and even donated them to archives and diaries and things. And it was sort of a mixed bag. So Ruth Erickson and Eleanor Stevenson, who I mentioned earlier, uh, I was really thrilled to find that not only did they maintain correspondence that was quite open about their relationship, but within that correspondence, they also connected their sexual politics with their uh, with their radical politics in really kind of personal and intimate ways. So um, Ruth Erickson wrote a poem for Eleanor Stevenson on her birthday that essentially described Eleanor Stevenson's gender in ways that were incredibly um, non-binary. So there were references to male gender, female gender, relational gender that were sort of not what I expected to find at that time. Uh, but the poem concluded with the, the line, uh, the people, yes, which was a common rallying cry on the left. And in that case, it was repurposed to describe the many people embodied in one, uh, one sort of gender um, variant uh, individual. So that was really thrilling to me to find that not only that was there, but that it was preserved and it somehow made its way into an archive. Um, that was surprising. But the other thing that was surprising to me was how carefully a lot of these lived uh, experiences were navigated in terms of how they were preserved. So Betty Millard, whose papers are at Smith uh, College, kept this diary and in the 1930s, there's all kinds of material around her radical activities, but also her uh, same sex affairs. And she actually took a knife, a, a sort of razor blade to some of the pages to excise passages that were uh, dangerous for some reason. And I can't know exactly what's in them, but there was something in that gesture, the gesture of both preservation saying, I have to actually remove these sections because I want the rest of it to remain. Uh, that felt very brave and, and very urgent to me. But then also the sort of heartbreak of knowing that there were certain dimensions that were so dangerous that they just couldn't be remembered. That was, that was a sort of heartbreak too. Um, so I think I was really surprised by how carefully the archival evidence uh, demonstrated that negotiation of what what could be remembered and what could not be remembered. And you know, I'm it's, you know, people say this all the time, but it was just like such an honor to be able to uh, have these individuals' lives um, made available to me. And I and I don't think that that was accidental. Yeah, I think that that's a such a, a fascinating piece. This idea of. Uh remembering and, and wanting to be remembered or not wanting to be remembered uh, and and what that might tell us about sort of the larger scope, not just of this story, but in, in general of what we know about history, uh, you know, what uh, not just things that have sort of been lost to time, but things that have been intentionally suppressed from from the history. Is there a disconnect? So there's people like Betty Millard who are, who are you know, excising pieces are there people uh, you mentioned the the people who are who are brave? You know, are there people who who were less careful? And you know, what what sort of effect did that have on their lives that that they were maybe a little more open about these experiences? Yeah. So one of the uh, people that I write about in this book is a black gay writer named Willard Motley, um, and he was followed by the FBI. So he has an FBI file so he can piece together some of his movements through that. Uh, but he eventually moved to Mexico, um, presumably 
to get away from American racism and also McCarthyism. Uh, so he moved to Mexico and, you know, in some respects, I don't know if that impacted his tendency to preserve absolutely everything, but the amount of papers that he left behind, you know, I spent weeks looking through his uh, papers out in Illinois and I, had a, I scratched the surface. He left so much. And so I don't know if that was connected to the fact that he was, he left, you know, he, he left the U.S., presumably, you know, in part to escape that kind of pressure. So we could learn more. And, and, and in the case of Motley, the most interesting thing that I found were unpublished stories that were really queer um, uh, from the 1940s and, and also drafts of his novel that was really ruthlessly edited for publication by his publisher. Um, but you can go back to the drafts and see, oh my God, he wrote this unbelievably radical queer novel in the 1940s and the version that we got still had the palimpsest of that but imagine if we'd had uh you know the whole thing so the one other thing that i'll say on that point is because i was in some cases able to access fbi files and i'm i'm presuming that maybe 10 years down the line i'm gonna get more that i requested uh <laughs> uh years ago um they take a long time to come in um, but some folks, you could really reconstruct this incredible pressure that they felt be, by putting their personal papers in conversation with the FBI files. So I sort of knew more than they did. So Edward Melkarth, who's an artist whose image is on the cover of the book and who the book opens with, was quite hounded by the FBI. And he wrote letters describing this sort of sense of paranoia as a gay leftist um, that he was being followed, that his passport was being taken away. And he would recount these kinds of incidents uh, in his life when he just felt like he was being surveyed and, and, and being followed and harassed, uh, really. And then you look at the FBI file and everything he said was true. <laughs> the, the things <laughs> that are in the file actually confirm the things that he's sort of convinced he's cracking up, you know, mm -hmm. he's convinced he's going mad. So there's also this weird way that we get multiple layers to the story that even the participants themselves didn't nece necessarily have. Uh, so yeah, it, some of the people were just brave and kept everything. Sometimes we get more than they could have even possibly preserved themselves. So in the final two chapters of your book, you uh, you talk about these sort of shifts from where we are in the, the 20s, 30s, 40s into first uh, this uh, popular front movement and then the move into the Cold War. <laughs> it was uh, great for me because I, I read a lot of historical fiction. And so, you know, so often I, I hear about a character sort of going off to the Spanish Civil War and thought, you know, why? And, you know, the, of course, the novels don't go into that. <laughs> so can you talk a little bit about what uh, what that looked like uh, in in general for uh, for communists, but then in particular what that meant for the sexual dissidents? Yeah, I think that it's a classic situation of the best of times and the worst of times. So obviously the fascist uh, or the rise of fascism was the worst of times, and it really produced a very existential threat uh, that required all hands on deck. So for leftists working in the U.S., some of the more revolutionary overthrow the state rhetoric shifted to um, aligning with anybody that was willing to fight against fascism in the interest of a greater good to stop what was happening globally um, in its tracks. And that sort of shifted the discourse away from this kind of revolutionary overthrow towards a kind of um, version of radicalism that was trying to welcome everybody into the, into the big tent. And, you know, I think that that probably sounds less radical than it was. There were nuances to it that really were not producing this kind of, um, you know, we, uh, what's that, hands across America uh, uh, kind of version of that. It was, it still had a, an anti-capitalist core to it, but it did allow for a more expansive democratization of the language that was used to talk about revolutionary politics. And that opened the door, I think, a little bit for uh, queer people to say, OK, we want to be part of this. Like, we want to be part of this narrative of who is an American. And that, 
I, I, I think that that really paved the way for some of the gay rights movement in the 1950s. Um, but it also the, the, the other side of that was that it also made possible, I think, a kind of political movement that could disaggregate sexuality from other forms of liberation. Mm -hmm. So it became possible for a gay rights movement to be formed by former communists that focused so intensely and exclusively on gay people that it didn't necessarily have that same self-consciousness about the ways that racism was actually um, also part of a shared struggle and and sexism and uh, and these other pieces sort of there was a new space for them to fall to the wayside a little bit. Um, so again, I don't want to suggest that this was something that was um, entirely pernicious. I think that it was a good thing that there was a vocal political movement advocating for gay rights. But I also think that that movement didn't stop evictions. It didn't end racism and, you know, even segregation. You know, when, when the gay rights movement formed in the 1950s, it was still a period when Jim Crow laws were in effect. And uh, it really had nothing to say about that. And so I do think that something was lost in moving away from that kind of coalition building. Um, but it also emerged out of a period of ex existential crisis that, that, you know, it's, it's a little easier maybe with hindsight to say uh, uh, what went wrong. Yeah, and so I think that that leads into then this, this homophile movement in the 50s, uh, this idea that, uh, that we're going to stop talking about sort of sex and, and vice and, mm -hmm. and, and talk about sort of social relationships and uh, being good capitalists. And, you know, I think <laughs> that I, I could see a through line. Uh, we're recording this on uh, the six year anniversary of the Supreme Court ruling uh, legalizing gay marriage. And so I could see sort of a, a through line from that to this focus on marriage, uh, you know, to to the exclusion to to some degree of, of uh, lots of other things that that we could want in in gay rights and trans rights. And so, you know, uh, can you talk some about that, that sort of moving away from radicalization uh, into sort of a, a very narrow conception, really, of what, uh, what it means to, uh, to be visible, to be accepted, uh, and, and how to do that in American culture? Yeah, I, I think that these are certainly perennial conversations that happen about not only what the relationship is between sex and sexuality and radical politics, but also what the relation is between radical politics and sort of um, pra practical uh, fights for, you know, basic rights. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's always something that's been uncomfortable. And you see some of these things even emerging uh, before the gay rights movement. Um, but I, but I do think that uh, there's something really powerful about the ways that movements that are revolutionary struggles have tried to push for a society that is better for everyone, you know, that's better for everyone. And, and so, you know, to my mind, the kind of liberationist revolutionary politics runs from the left through, you know, black nationalism, through, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter, you know, there's this kind of radical thread that to me feels like a, a space of hope for queer people that's not necessarily oriented around let's get this or that right, let's get <laughs> change this or that law, but sees the struggles of queer people as part of a much larger form of, of social change. And I, you know, I, I think it's a little bit of a crude opposition that gets set up oftentimes, um, especially in, you know, hot takes in, in, you know, cable news or whatever, um, that says, you know, there's pro-marriage and anti-marriage gay politics. And I, I, you know, I don't think that there's many people who would advocate for restrictive marriage laws, even on the left, even even people who are committed to these kinds of like broader forms of social change. Um, but the question is, you know, where does the energy go? You know, what what is the thing and how do you know when you're done? If you if you if your movement is defined by a narrowly defined outcome, 
once you reach that, you know, you either disappear or you just move on to the next achievable outcome. And, and, and that can, that can be really challenging for a movement to maintain momentum. So I sort of think there's something um, powerful about thinking about these revolutionary struggles that continue, that persist, that maybe shape, shape shift a little bit, but continue to um, exert pressure uh, on liberation for a much, much more expansive um, swath of the population than, you know, than just uh, getting this or that right. Yeah, definitely. I, I heard a podcast recently with Sasha Eisenberg, who's uh, just published a book about uh, gay marriage and the 25 year struggle. And, you know, that that is part of like, why was this successful? Well, it was successful because there was a particular thing they were going for and they got it and right. they were done. <laughs> right. But uh, but that doesn't then keep that energy going to, to other uh, other rights. So how can uh, people get your wonderful book? go to your local independent bookseller or your online website that is not attached to a gigantic corporation and keep those indies alive. Um, but it's available in, in pretty much any bookstore or uh, online bookseller. Excellent. Uh, I'll put a, a link through bookshop.org so people can, can find it there. Uh, it's a, it's a great read. Uh, and I'm, I'm so excited to have learned uh, this uh, part of history that I just didn't know anything about. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening to Unsung History. You can find the sources used for this episode at unsunghistorypodcast.com. To the best of our knowledge, all audio and images used by Unsung History are in the public domain or are used with permission. You can find us on Twitter or Instagram at unsung underscore underscore history or on Facebook at Unsung History Podcast. To contact us with questions or episode suggestions, please email kelly at unsunghistorypodcast.com. If you enjoyed this podcast, please rate and review and tell your friends.